And I'd like to begin by thanking the Office for the Rights of People with Disabilities in Belarus for the opportunity to stand here today and to share some thoughts with you on the impact of deinstitutionalization on the lives of people with disabilities. Um, my first time in Belarus, and an opportunity also to see something of the beautiful city of Minsk, so th thank you very much. Evaluating the impact of social policy of de deinstitutionalization and trying to get a good idea of how well countries are doing in supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is something which I've been engaged in for over 30 years now. I'm a professor, and sometimes professors have bad reputations. We read a lot of papers, we sit in our offices, but we're not necessarily connected with the real world. Sometimes that's true. So I thought I'd better just let you know something a little bit about my background, because I'm only fairly recently a professor. 25, 30 years ago, I was working in the health system in England with responsibility for developing community services for the most severely disabled and most challenging people who are currently living in our institutions. I was closely involved with two of the largest institutions in Southeast England. I then became a researcher mainly for our government in trying to see how well we were doing in providing community services. And then more recently, I became involved in something Serge I mentioned at the beginning, which is about how we get better information about how well we are doing as a country in supporting people with disabilities. So I was a director of a government unit charged with getting better information and making best use of the information, not only to health and welfare organisations, but to people with disabilities, to families supporting people and to the general public. So I'll be speaking from different perspectives. But sorry, I wanted... <laughs> okay. But so I wanted to make some comments on two questions. First, what can we learn from the research which has been undertaken around the world on the impact of deinstitutionalization? And the second question I wanted to say something about is, how should we be doing this? How should we, as a country or a municipality, be evaluating how well we're doing in supporting people with disabilities to live a life of dignity, or to protect their rights, or to improve their quality of life, or their inclusion, whatever terms we wish to use. I will probably spend more time on the first question, uh, but the last slide that I put up will have my email address on. And I'm very happy to enter into discussion by email after the conference or over lunch or over, over, over coffee about some of the things which I don't have time to talk about this morning. Deinstitutionalization has always been a very controversial social policy. Maybe my friends from Denmark will tell me it's different. Uh, no. it, is, it has always been a controversial social policy, which has been hard fought for, often by parents, often by advocacy organisations. And because of that, it's, a, it's one of those areas of social policy that relate to people with disabilities that has attracted a lot of research. This is something we do know something about. A substantial body of research has asked, tried to ask the question, do people benefit from deinstitutionalization? Who benefits from deinstitutionalization? I just want to share some few messages which has come out of that body of research. Well, first, just to say something about the nature of the research. To give you an idea of the scale of the information which is available, a decade ago, the government of Ireland um, asked us to provide an independent overview of the scientific knowledge about deinstitutionalization. We were just looking at scientific studies which have been published in, in the English language. But over that decade leading up to uh, 2005, uh, when we undertook this for the Irish government, uh, we identified 86 scientific publications. There's a wealth of information out there. Much of it, most of it, has come from the world's rich countries. That's true. 
which has looked at many, many different aspects of the institution. And for me, there are two key messages which come out of this scientific literature. And the, the, the messages are quite different because it depends what ask, questions you're going to ask. An obvious question to ask of deinstitutionalization is does it make a difference? Do the people who are moved from institutions to the community have a better quality of life, have more dignity than people who didn't? Are those people living in community <laughs> services having a better quality of life than people living in institutions? Is it better than what went before? And there is a very, very clear message across studies undertaken over several decades, over many countries, over many continents, that the answer to that question is yes. Particularly in some areas. So there is very good evidence that deinstitutionalization leads to increased choice empowerment and self-determination of people with disabilities, even people with the most severe disabilities. There's very good evidence that deinstitutionalization brings about greater levels of participation. Participation in terms of social relationships, participation in terms of engagement with civic and community activities. Participation in the things which we occupy our life on a day-to-day -day basis. I was once program director for the provincial institution in Canada, which covered Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I was in charge of the care for those people from that institution who had intellectual disabilities. And they spent most of their time waiting for the next activity to happen. They were engaged in life. They were engaged in waiting for something to happen and spent their time occupying themselves while waiting, maybe rocking backwards and forwards, staring at their hands, whatever. We engage in all the time in our lives around us. We are doing things. So it's not just participation on a larger scale of relationships, it's participation in activities of daily life, in cooking, in shopping. So the benefits are clear, but they're not benefits in all areas. There are some areas in which we know that deinstitutionalization does not bring these benefits. And an important one there is the level of emotional and behavioral disorders of people with intellectual disabilities. Many studies have looked at does deinstitutionalization make, make a difference and the overall answer is no, it doesn't seem to. So there are benefits in some areas. In other areas, it doesn't seem to be any great benefits. And there are some areas in which we really don't know enough. Not enough work has been done to be come, to come to a judgment. But one of the things that we do know is that so far, we have not found any area of quality of life in which deinstitutionalization harms people with disabilities. And that's part of the Underlying Hippocratic Oath, underlying medical ethics is at first do no harm. From what we know, the evidence suggests that the institutionalization does no harm and can bring benefit. So that's the first key message. Deinstitutionalization brings benefits to people with disabilities. The second message is less positive. Because those of us who have been involved in the process of deinstitutionalization in different countries could see the benefits that it had brought to people, but they weren't at the scale to which we were aspiring. However, we frame the aims of our disability policy, deinstitutionalization was a step towards those aims, but did not deliver. So, yes. People have more choice and control over their lives, but often in fairly small aspects. 
they could choose a bot to eat rather than meals being brought from the central canteen. They could choose which activities to involve. In. So what are the things that we value in terms of choice? Well, for me, it's who am I living with? You know, if someone took away my choice about who I was going to be spending my time living with, I would be pretty upset. Choice about where I live. And when you look at the impact of deinstitutionalization in many countries on those life-defining choices, then deinstitutionalization has been better, but it has not achieved what we set out to achieve. Yes, people are participating more in their society, but they're still more likely to be excluded, still more likely to be victims of crime and of abuse and discrimination. So deinstitutionalization is a step on the way to improving the dignity of people with disabilities, but it's not the full solution. I just want to skip back to the previous slide because there's another issue that I, 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 I wanted to mention. I mentioned that these observations about the benefits of deinstitutionalization hold true across different countries, across time, but they also hold true across different groups of people with disabilities, including people with the most severe disabilities. What the research indicates is that the de institutionalization is possible for all people with disabilities and beneficial to all people with disabilities. Now, for practical reasons, deinstitutionalization policies frequently begin by providing more independent living options for the most able people within our institutions. And there are some good reasons to start with that. But we do need to keep in mind, particularly if we're thinking about planning strategically and looking ahead, that that's just a pragmatic starting point. And that we need to think about how we will provide community-based alternatives for people with severe disabilities, including severe behavioural disorders. That was my job 25 years ago, to do that. And we did that for a population of 3.5 million people. So, deinstitutionalisation was beneficial. It was a step on the way, and a very important step on the way, in realising the potential and promoting the dignity and the human rights and quality of life of people with disabilities. But it wasn't sufficient to attain our goals. So then people begin to think about, well, what else do we need to do? Yes, we need to provide services in the community in smaller, less institutional settings. But what else do we need to do to make this work for people? And we've talked about some of those, staff training, changing the mindset of people, giving people, giving support staff new skills so that they could do a different job to what they've been used to. Legislation around discrimination, for, for example. Mass marketing to try and change public attitudes towards people with disabilities. All these are important things to do. The area which I have focused on and want to make just a few comments about is also getting better information about what we're doing. In terms of developing ways in which we can measure and make available to the public, to government agencies and other concerned agencies, good quality information about how well we are doing over time in different localities in relation to people who don't have this. It's measuring that gap between social inclusion or quality of life between people with and without disabilities over time, which is important. It's not just enough to do better for people with disabilities. We need to narrow that gap. And it's important that we look at that gap. I'll give you an example. We, I work in Australia much of the time now. And one of, the, one of the things that we do every year is provide a report on the relative social inclusion of young Australians with disabilities. And over the past decade or so, 
in a rich country which has got much richer, the, the inclusion of people with disabilities has increased. Employment rates have increased, etc. And that's to be celebrated. But the employment rates of non-disabled Australians has increased even faster. So while progress has been made in improving the circumstances of people with disabilities, that gap, that disadvantage faced by people with disabilities has actually grown in one of the world's rich countries at a time of unprecedented economic growth. Why monitor this gap in well-being? Well, for those countries that have signed and ratified the United Nations Convention, it is an obligation to do so. For those countries who are considering it, it will become an obligation to do so if you take that step. But in a sense, more importantly, rather than just satisfying the UN Committee, how I find it difficult to understand how any government or indeed any organisation can be effective in its achieving its aims if it doesn't know how it's progressing. And that is the situation in many countries, including, I have to say, in England at the moment. We're trying to address that and we're looking at the moment about developing a system of national indicators of well-being for people with intellectual disabilities. What successful organisation, whether it's in the commercial sector or industry or social policy, can work without having good information about what it's achieving, which bits of the organisation are doing better than others, and making that available, not just within the organisation, but externally so it can be held to account. How's time? Uh, not good, okay. <laughs> there, there are two more slides, which I won't show you, uh, but I'd be very happy to talk about. There are slides about what we might think about monitoring, and there were slides about how we might do it. Some, of, some ideas of which are what we mentioned, national disability surveys. The World Health Organization is currently working on a model disability survey for countries, which will be freely available which could be used to uh, monitor the well-being of people with disabilities. We've talked, and there's a question raised earlier, uh, about disability statistics, and there's a Washington group on disability statistics trying to work out ways of doing that in a sensible way, which works across countries, so you don't have this 3% versus, in, in the UK, it's well over 20% of people identified as, as having a disability. And also information that we can collect from disability organisations, some services supporting people with disability, which you can then make public as a way of, of, of monitoring the well-being of people with disabilities. But I just want to step to the conclusions, because that's the technical detail. And as I said, I'm very happy to discuss that by email or in, 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 in person, the, the technical aspects of this. This meeting is about deinstitutionalisation. And the the scientific experience, the scientific knowledge about this, suggests that over many countries, over many decades, deinstitutionalisation has been an important step towards realising the rights of people with disabilities, towards providing a life of dignity, a life of quality for people with disabilities. It's an important step in that direction. And we need to think carefully about how we undertake that step. But we also need to think carefully about and what else do we need to do to make this really work. And to know that whatever strategies we adopt in any country or any locality in implementing deinstitutionalisation, it is working for people with disabilities, for all people with disabilities in that country or in that municipality. We do really do need to think carefully about how we measure the gap in the quality of life or well-being of our citizens who are disabled and those who are not disabled. Thank you.